How many of you have heard of a gentleman named Mohamed Bouazizi? Just a couple. How many of you have heard of the Arab Spring? There's a gentleman um, named Mohamed Bouazizi who was a fruit vendor in Tunisia. And every day he would bring his fruit and he would uh, bring it to market. And this is how he would feed his family. However, because of the ecosystem that he lived in, uh, he was harassed. He could not uh, register his business. He had trouble with the most basic things in rule of law and property rights that we take for granted. And he became so desperate over and over again that he got in a fight with a police officer who spit on him, took away not only his fruit, but his right to be on that street corner. He walked to the governor's office that day, and he cried out, how do you expect me to make a living? And he lit himself on fire. I don't think any of us in this room can imagine the desperation that goes into an action like that. But that was the start of the Arab Spring. And the Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto interviewed all of the survivors and the family members of the people who followed Bozizi's unfortunate example and lit themselves on fire in self-immolation and protest. And he found a common thread. And it's encapsulated in what something that Bozizi's brother, Salem, said. De Soto said, what would Muhammad say if he were alive today? And Salem said, Muhammad would say that even the poor should have the right to buy and sell. And I think that narrative of just basic entrepreneurship, having an ecosystem in which you can take the talents that you have and apply them to the service of others, whether it's something as simple as putting fruit on another family's table or building an app that can change the world. Those ecosystems are what allow people to build prosperity for themselves and their families. And so our next two speakers are here to talk about those ecosystems. They come from the North African and Middle Eastern regions. They're talking about how they're building the ecosystems here in this country and all over the world. Habib Haddad is a former vice chair of the World Economic Forum. And he, we have him here. We're lucky enough to have him here. Um, I'm sorry, the Council on Entrepreneurship specifically. We're lucky enough to have him here uh, at the MIT Media Lab. He's running the E14 Fund, which is taking all the fascinating inventions and, and ideas that are here at ML MIT and helping, take, helping them take flight uh, with investment. We also have Ziad Sultan, who leads product management for Newsstand, which is Google Play's uh, news platform, which reaches over a billion people, including me. So please welcome these two wonderful people to talk about this important subject. Hey, Habib. Hi, Ziad. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mark, for this uh, very powerful intro. Uh, we're going to talk about communities. And I think uh, I'm feeling very lucky to have my very good friend here, Habib, who has some uh, very interesting experiences when it comes to the power of ecosystems and communities across continents. So we're hoping to cover a few topics um, that have to do with this unusual path to venture capital, which comes from social impact and activism. Uh, very interesting and unusual, so we'll touch a bit on that. Uh, and I was hoping to also ask you about your experience in the Middle East uh, with building uh, a dynamic platform and community of entrepreneurship. Uh, and then we'll ask you about your next steps right here in the MIT Media Lab. Uh, so to start with, you're pretty famous now in the Middle East as the founder of Yamli, and pretty much everything you've done before being a VC has had a social impact uh, aspect to it uh, that has been very important. Could you tell us a little bit about your journey from 
activist and entrepreneur to uh, venture capital investor? Yeah, sure. Um, so to put some context, I, I, I graduated from undergrad from, from in Lebanon, in, in Beirut, and then I moved to USC uh, right before 9-11 uh, and to, to work on uh, what was my dream and work in Hollywood on computer graphics. And little did I know that actually it was very hard to find a job for an Arab in Hollywood right around that time. And uh, at that time, my ex-girlfriend was actually at MIT. My wife is here. She's not my ex-girlfriend from that time. Uh, uh, so I still had her password, the username and password. And I remember I went on her account, and I found this crazy uh, C-Sale uh, uh, team that are working on uh, image-based modeling uh, uh, platform at that time. So I took a flight, flew to Boston, joined as a founding member, and built uh, this company. It was called Mock3, which was an amazing technology still up, up until today, but we did everything wrong in the book. In fact, uh, not long ago, I was walking down the hallway at MIT Media Lab, and I uh, came across uh, uh, Joost Bonson, who teaches uh, adventure here at MIT, and he said, I know this company. I actually teach it, uh, use it as what not to do in my, in my courses. <laughs> so. So I did that, and, and at some point we came in, uh, uh, the VCs had taken over, they fired us. Uh, the product was amazing, but we kind of obsessed so much about the technology, kind of like the rookie one, uh, the mistake of, of building a, a technology company. Uh, and then after that, I did what every immigrant entrepreneur wants to do, uh, join a big company. Uh, went, went to join ATI, uh, worked on the graphic card industry, uh, right around the time when GPU was taking, were taking off. Worked there for two years, right until I got my green card. And I, as soon as I got my green tar card, I jumped on board and started my company, Yemli, which is an, an Arabic linguistics company. In fact, when you said about social activism, the, the company in itself started around the time where, when there was a war be in, in Lebanon, between Lebanon and Israel, and the time where I wanted to find information online, but I couldn't because I didn't have an Arabic keyboard. So the idea of being able to type phonetically using English characters came about, and therefore was the, so the base of Yemli around which was a search engine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Fast forward um, in 2011, completely uh, by, by, co by coincidence, not by, by design, I find myself in the middle of the Arab Spring. Uh, most of the people, of the leaders of that movement were uh, techies, were entrepreneurs, uh, people that I had been interacting with with my, my Yemli hat. Uh, and uh, I remember even a few months earlier to uh, January 25, which was the kickoff of the Arab Spring, in Egypt at least, uh, some of my friends were emailing me and saying, we want to do this Facebook group, we want to work on those uh, interesting cunning techniques to push people to protest, but we don't know anything about that, but we're going to push people to go on the streets of Alexandria, wear black t-shirts, look at the sea, and turn your back, and all using Facebook. And if you remember, actually, uh, interesting, um, at that time, at some point, Facebook had groups where you had to actually uh, asked to join them. It was not an open, free-flow uh, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, designed group. And then it was very interesting because before that, before the Arab Spring, a number of attempts were tried to, pe to, to build movements and build communities around online tools, but they always failed because the tools were clunky, they were not open enough, not distributed enough. And I think a number of different factors, um, not only social media, social media was a big part of it, allowed this group to come very quickly together. And then um, uh, one thing that kind of opened my eyes uh, was on uh, January 28th, if I remember well, uh, the internet in Egypt was shut down. And, uh, and this was a big problem because uh, all the news that everyone was getting about what's happening on the streets was coming from social media. And so, so people on the streets would take pictures, and then the police would not actually uh, take a brutal action because those pictures were being tweeted. And then the internet was shut down. Everyone was worried about that. At that time, um, Google and Twitter uh, were talking to us uh, as, as, as on my startup hat. And as you can see, we're switching activism and entrepreneurship all the time. And they said, well, listen, we're thinking about launching a product that would allow people to bypass the shutdown. And the way to do that is to give people a no phone number that you call on, and then you leave your voicemail. And this voicemail would go on, on Twitter. It was called Speak to Tweet. And as soon as this uh, uh, went on, we called our friends uh, who were journalists. They, they, they pushed the, the numbers out. People started calling, but they were all in Arabic. So it would, they wouldn't reach a big mass. So I went on Twitter and said, hey, I need uh, volunteers to help me transcribe and translate those, those messages. 
And in literally like less than, than a few hours, I had a thousand translators uh, join, and we had like a Google sheet, a very simple Google spreadsheet. Uh, they would listen to the voicemails on Twitter, put them, transcribe them, translate them, and, and move, move across the, uh, the line. And which was quite interesting because we could uncover a few interesting insights. Uh, uh, we, we would figure out that they were the hooligans that were, that were launched on the streets. And all of this got me so excited, and I met so many great people and so many great you know, creative ideas, innovative ideas. Uh, but obviously, I got very disappointed with the outcome after the Arab Spring, what happened post-Arab Spring. And this is when I decided that I want to jump and what kind of led me to the venture capital world, which was a very interesting uh, kind of weird path. But this is when I, I thought, well, there's so much energy and so much creativity in this part of the world, proven by when they were pushed to the edges um, by the regimes, by the Arab Spring, but not necessarily used for productive means. So I felt it was much easier to build movements against something than for something. It's much easier to say, I want to go fight this than I want to go and build a long-term sustainable plan to build, create jobs and opportunities and entrepreneurship. And so I took on this as my next step and moved to the Middle East at that time. So a very unusual path and filled with uh, social mission. And I remember from the very beginning, the mission of Yamli, if you can maybe remind us just for context, the company that Habib founded, which is very famous in the Arab-speaking world, is Yamli, which is a transliteration engine. It's actually very difficult with an English keyboard uh, to actually interact with Arabic content, and that also leads to very little Arabic content created, very little Arabic content consum consumed online. Right. So from the very beginning, it's a technology play, but to use Magat. Uh, Thing. It was not a pizza, pizza delivery app. It was literally a way to get Arabic content represented online for all sorts of very powerful missions. Um, so can you remind us maybe, what was the proportion of Arabic content to Arabic population? Do you remember that? Uh, that was yeah, your, I remember. It one was, of your key. Yeah, well, there, was, uh, there was approximately 5 to 10% Arabic speakers online, but there was about 0.5% content at that time. And so the goal was how can you push content and how can you build knowledge in, in, in a, in a, in a, with 350 million speakers who don't have n native language, that, with content with their native language where they can learn and, and push their knowledge. Through. Yeah, and I wanted to take that small detour to give context and also because that still feels like a very powerful uh, mission that easy, you can easily imagine how communication and easy communication, fluid communication was at the basis of the company you founded, but then this is one of the main reasons you got pulled into the center of a lot of very important movements during the Arab, Arab Spring. Um, I, I remember uh, my software development team, at the time I was working on my own company, they were based in Alexandria yeah. uh, around that same time, and so literally my soft software development team uh, lost internet connectivity overnight. We couldn't reach them, we didn't know what they were up to, if they were okay. Uh, and it, it, was, it was a very chaotic time. Um, and had a, you had a very, uh, very powerful team. I mean, you had, uh, you, the team that you were working with in Alexandria was one of the best, one of the best engineers. Uh, the, very good talent in Egypt. Uh, the, exactly. So the, 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 they were fantastic in terms of talent and what they were able to, to, to work on and deliver. But they also were able to take on some very unusual challenges like lack of electricity, lack of security. Uh, with like, uh, with grace and, uh, and 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 you know strength, and it was a great example, very inspiring, um, and so that leads me to maybe the next chapter that I would love uh, for us to discuss, which is you're coming from this perspective of there is definitely a need for technology to help the region in terms of both the technology itself, but also the ecosystem and the community around it, so that you can go from being against something to trying to create, right? And so I remember you taking a plane and leaving for the Middle East and trying to work on uh, what became a very powerful platform and fund. Uh, can you tell us a little bit how that process worked out? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so the, the excitement of, of seeing the Arab Spring kind of opened my eyes on, on, on how much talent there was. And then I moved to the Middle East. I mean, the reason was to build 
eventually a, a, a venture fund, but, in, but starting with a community. Um, and if you, if you look today at most of the venture funds in the US, Sequoia and Bison Horowitz, they all have a fund first, and eventually they have a platform to support that. Uh, what was interesting in, in my experience is that in emerging markets, uh, I had to create a platform first, and the platform was to develop the ecosystem. And as you develop the ecosystem, then you start investing in it. So if we started by creating what today became one of the biggest media arms uh, of, 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 of tech and entrepreneurship in the Middle East, kind of like the tech launch of the Middle East, called WAMDA. Then we built mentorship programs, we built accelerators, and it was really kind of a, a very ad hoc kind of fill the gaps uh, uh, endeavor. Well, let's build this. Oh, there's mentorship gap here. Oh, there's accelerator gaps here. Oh, we should go to work in Morocco or work in Kuwait or Saudi, whatever it is. And over time, we, uh, and we had a fund uh, as well, initially a small fund. And in emerging markets at that time, most of the VCs came from investment banking background and usually failed investment bankers because the funds are usually smaller. So the, the term sheets and the discussion, the, the negotiation with entrepreneurs were, was really, were really disgusting. So we had a really easy kind of gap to fill, but then the problem was on how to scale that. So we, we built a few things, and even, even eventually, in the Middle East, which is made of 23 countries, are, is a big market but fragmented because you have borders and uh, you have to figure out how to work across borders. We figured out as well that one of the interesting ways to scale startups as they grow was working with large corporates and large family offices who have been established in the region for a long time, have businesses and are willing to uh, want to innovate and they do that through startups. So fast forward, today we have a $75 million fund. Uh, we invest all across the Middle East. Uh, we came across a number of those war stories, uh, entrepreneurs, by the way, and, and we kind of are, have been able to build the platform and then eventually build the fund. And that, kind of that, that told me how important and how um, un, underestimated is the power of communities. Uh, and I think we take it granted uh, in the VC industry and the entrepreneurship industry in the U.S., but it's something that actually really is at the key uh, uh, first layer of, of ecosystems. So let me ask you a question. I believe that one of the most important parts of a community is some key success stories, right? Because it's more than just an example for everybody else. It actually graduates alumni who have seen the movie play out from nothing to a big company. It creates angel investors. It creates advisors, right? Yeah. Um, but how do, you, how do you create these anchor companies, and do you see that happening around the Middle East, and how is the community coming together around that? It's a very interesting question, especially when you start when you don't have too many successes. There were like a couple of successes, but not enough to make a, a, a big story around them. So that's why initially we started with a media company. And the media company, we were over-celebrating the story, sometimes even pushing it a bit more than it, it is just to recreate a message. And we would take those stories of, you know, for example, there's uh, one of the entrepreneurs that I really like, uh, uh, Mohamed Rashim, who was actually based in Aleppo. And when the war started in Aleppo, he fled to Jordan what, and eventually built one, what became one of the largest e-commerce platforms in the region. Uh, so that's a story you celebrate, you share, you talk about, about it. That kind of inspires others. Another, another company is, is two guys, Eli Khouri and Jad, who were, who were based a bit north of Beirut. And one, when, when the war in 2006 happened, uh, they didn't have access to internet anymore. They, they had a dial-up connection. They built a company called Wupra, which is one of, a big analytics company today. Um, and, uh, and they had to create their own um, compression algorithm because they were using dial-up. And this compression algorithm became the basis of their technology that actually moved in the valley and raised their, their venture back there. So those small stories, those are what you want to celebrate. And you kind of start activating small lights here and there in the community. And these kind of have a small radius of, of inspiration, not very large, but small radius of inspiration. And then you have to obviously put money where your mouth is and start investing more and more. And then until you create those success stories that are the unicorns, only now that uh, this, the Middle East startup ecosystem became commercially viable. You're starting to see unicorns all over the place. Uh, you have acquisitions. Asian companies are buying left and right. And it's becoming one of those emerging markets that's there to grab. I see. And so on the point of the media company, as an avid reader of the posts that you guys were creating, I know there is a thirst for success stories. And so it actually is something very important. Even if it is not the next billion dollar company, just the daily accomplishments of an ecosystem being documented, being shared, being celebrated, I think is something that everybody there recognizes and uh, actually wants as part of this, of belonging to this ecosystem. So I think that was extremely helpful to everybody. Even me from here reading it over there, I thought it was, it was really yeah, helpful. And I think also, it's, I mean, 
the fear of failure and all of the stuff that we hear about that, I mean, they're much more accentuated in emerging markets because you are, you know, you want to create a job for yourself. You also, it, it's not something that's very common being an entrepreneur and leaving what potentially could be a good job. Uh, and so, so just talking about it and make it make it more credible and making it more, the, putting it as, as heroes uh, of the region is something that was very important. And this is why, um, in retrospect, if I look at communities, I kind of, uh, could, building successful communities around building three main key elements, uh, communities of interest, communities of action, and of purpose. And when you combine the three, then you have a very powerful movement. Uh, so interest is around, uh, you know, in this case, is around entrepreneurship, is around just building tools, technology, and it manifests itself. We did it through the media platform, but it could be done around anything else. If we have an interest in VC, we come to the conference, we, we read stuff about it. So we linked, but with a very weak link. The second thing is action. So bring people together to build really cool projects. So we used to do those workshops with, with MIT Media Lab, where each year the, the, the faculty and some, uh, some students would go, and for a couple of weeks now, we bring startups and, and, and faculty members, and they build really cool uh, innovations innovations on smart cities or how to uh, work with, how to get old cities more, uh, uh, more risk resilient. And so this is kind of the action part, we bring people together. Arab Spring was an example of the action part. Uh, and the third, third, the most important thing is purpose. You kind of keep, keep reminding the community that it has a bigger purpose than just being a group of people linked together. In this case, was creating jobs, was dignity, was pushing the future of the region together, and that's very important when you build, when you want to build long-term communities. Yeah, unlocking potential and talent, I think, is one of the big ones. You have people who are extremely talented, very dynamic, and just having that avenue, uh, and not depending on just local opportunities, but creating your own. I think is like one of the big drivers. Absolutely, and also when you think about it, is 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 and Brad Feld says something has a word that's very nice: and, uh, hierarchies over network, uh, uh, networks over hierarchies. Uh, so distributed models of of rather than top down, and and. In the Middle East as well, uh, you, uh, you see countries that are in the Gulf, like in the UAE or Saudi or Kuwait, where they have a lot of cash. They try to build always import and build. We want to build the John Hopkins University. We want to build the, the Silicon Valley. And it's always about, like, let's pay and let's build this big economical zone where we're going to bring all the creative people and they're going to figure it out. That never works. And so uh, it's al almost always bottom up with some helping hand on making sure that your regulations and, and all the, and all the, uh, the red, red tape is off. So, in terms of bootstrapping such a community, there's one area we don't always agree on. And it's the role of adapting existing technologies locally, which you call copy-paste innovation, <laughs> or actually transformational stuff coming up locally with things that are worldwide, uh, like, impact. And, of course, the second one, the worldwide coming up with the next transformational technology is more glorious. Um, but is there room when you're dealing with a community that is not yet completely mature and has a lot of opportunities to create these kind of dynamics to actually adapt locally <coughs> successful models from elsewhere and create some success stories that trains engineers, designers, uh, that gets the capital flowing, that gets success stories going? Uh, and does that help as a good way to bootstrap a, such a community? Uh, so, so or, what yes. is your, what's your point? What, what, uh, what's your one sentence? You don't, you don't believe in copy-paste or so that we can get people to vote on which ones they agree with? <laughs> so my, my take, and I remember calling you on when you were catching the plane on the way to the Middle East, you know, um, was don't neglect the copy-paste because it will stimulate innovation and success stories. And I'm not saying you did neglect it, but I think the, the mind share is always more present on the other stuff. Like we're going to create something completely new. Um, but I think the first one is a great way to also like put money, ideas, talent to work on success stories. So I think it's powerful. Yeah. No, I, th so I think actually we do agree. On <laughs> no, we, did, we didn't agree five years ago. <laughs> so I think, I mean, the thing is, um, 
uh, you see a lot of copy paste innovate. So the Amazon of the Middle East, Uber of the Middle East. But usually it doesn't stop at just having uh, the right business models, the business economics, and just building a company that does e commerce, whatever. It usually happens where they have to build many things around it. So souk.com, which is um, the first unicorn a few years ago, became a unicorn in the Middle East, basically. Uh, had to build their own um, e-commerce platform, but then they had to build their own payment as well mm -hmm. because they could, the credit card penetration was low and people would use something called cash on delivery. And cash on delivery, where you, you say I want to pay with cash, but once it gets delivered to your door, the impulse buying is lost, so you said I don't want anymore. And if you're shipping across border, then they have to give stuck in customs, a whole issue. So that to, to fix that, they, they create those, those scratch cards that are available in many different emerging markets. That became a different company on its own. They also had to create their own uh, logistics company, because last mile delivery was also a pain in, in, in some countries. So um, there's always a copy paste, but there's always an innovate next to it. Uh, and I think that the difficulty of building business in emerging markets also builds walls. Uh, and so other uh, international competitors have a much tougher uh, way of actually entering those markets. Okay. All right, so we agree more than before. Yeah. <laughs> um, but speaking of when you were on the plane on the way to the Middle East, what was your first investment while you were heading there, it was, it was in my company, so big disclaimer. Um, but it brings me to the next question, which is what is the role of your existing network as an investor and how does that relate to your next step as somebody coming back to lead the E14 fund at MIT? So, uh, I mean, I'm a proud investor in Ziad's company. Uh, friends and investors, uh, and, and I, I was telling Ziad before we, we got on stage about how important I think as an early stage investor you have to build a relationship with the entrepreneurs. And, um, uh, and it's really about the, the, the personal connections that, that, that one has to build. Because most of the time, and a lot of VCs would come and say, we bring value and we're going to open doors and we're going to create this whole amazing thing for you. But really, it's all about the entrepreneur. And, if, and, and, and the role of the VC is very much a, gui a, a, a guiding, a sounding board and a guiding person more than anything else. And also a therapy provider, well, a, a therapist. And I'm not, I, I, I have been his therapist. I would lie as on the couch. As, 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 he, as he has been my in many different cases. <laughs> but it's very important to build that relationship. And um, I'm actually quite lucky now that I, I'm moving and I'm building um, the E14 fund, which is a fund that initially was incubated at the Media Lab and now is spinning uh, out to, uh, to focus on all of MIT, where I could build those relationships early on with uh, students that are still within, are thinking about, about spinning off companies. I think it's very important, not just because uh, we need to be aligned. It's not about I have to be friends before to invest, because I really need to know who you are. I need to know who I am. I need to know how to interact, what, wh how, how you like to work, how, to, how you think. Because at the end of the day, as an early stage VC, it's really about pushing you to do the best what you can and giving you my network. And you have to figure this, this out. In fact, when I first moved, and, and I'm trying to figure out MIT, I'm new to MIT, uh, I realized that there's so many programs all over the place, really amazing programs, uh, but there's so many of them, it's, it's lost. There's like a map, and, and like I don't know who's what, and, 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 and where I can get money, etc. And I was like trying to figure it out, but I was, I was talking to students, I realized, you know, you don't have to, because the good students, they, know, they have figured it all out. They get all the free money, all the free network, all the free support. They just know how to work, work the network uh, out. So it's really about putting it out, making sure it's accessible. And as, a, as, a, as a, someone who has gone through the motion as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur as an investor, it's about just giving you advice here and there, but also being sure that you are there at all times in terms of the support they need. OK, and I have one question, but I don't know if we have time for uh, opening up for the Q&A after this question, or was this the? Uh question and then we have to wrap up. <laughs> okay, so my last question was when you're uh, talking about the people who know how to navigate the system, uh, which is great, how do you feel about as an investor, so as a VC I was always torn that the people you are most likely to invest in are the ones who need you the least, right? Like if you're, it's a moving train, people don't even need you and you're trying to be like, no, please take my money. On the other side, uh, you have people you think you can really help and if they just get things r started the right way, uh, it could be a very powerful story. And how do, how do you kind of navigate the two? I see it as, as more of a very long-term game. Uh, I don't think you can find a company that's moving very fast and just the company will not move fast. It's not like an, an abrupt uh, binary thing where sometimes it's moving slow and then it's going to move fast very quickly. It's moving fast from a long time ago. 
So you have to catch it early on. And to catch it early on, you have to put, position yourself and really be a very friendly and very thoughtful uh, investor that's going to work and open up your doors and all of that. Uh, actually, um, Joe Ito, who's the director of the Media Lab, has something that's, that's you know, has, he has his book called Whiplash, which has 10 principles. And, and he, one of, two of his principles that apply to your question. One is power of pull. Uh, and it's the idea that you actually uh, position yourself and you work within the, that you actually pull on the network rather than push on the network. And if you, if you are in a position where companies will actually come to you, then it becomes more, much more easier than you actually pushing on that. And number two is uh, the compass over map. So rather than, than thinking about, about this is the strategy you want to go after and really planning for it, it's about just being able to have a, a compass and to navigate that system. It really comes down to a mindset approach. Uh, and so at the Media Lab, for example, even the companies that, that spin off and we don't invest in, like I always, we always make sure that we create a community, that we link them back, and eventually they'll come around. The next startups, when they want to launch it, they'll come around. All right, Habib, it's been a pleasure to see you uh, improve the community in terms of activism. It's, it's been a pleasure to see you push the community in the Middle East. And as I'm looking, your investor. As my <laughs> investor. And, and looking forward to your efforts in the MIT community and the Boston area. Thank you.